I grew up in uh, the northeast of the United States and also to uh, a small extent on the west coast, um, specifically from Massachusetts uh, predominantly. Um, and uh, I have come to uh, Toronto, Canada in the past uh, six years uh, for a second uh, home of sorts, um, along with two other revert uh, brothers. The, n the name Koa was, uh, was selected actually by letters uh, that were placed into uh, a kind of hat or uh, just a box. Uh, if I'm to in entirely trust my parents at their account uh, of the time. <laughs> uh, and anyway, the, the letters uh, were drawn um, K-O-A-H, uh, if I recall correctly, is what my father said, was drawn out of the hat. Now, that's not the spelling of my name that would end up on the birth certificate and thereafter. Uh, it was C-O-A, but uh, the method of choosing the letters uh, still remains an obvious novelty. Uh, <laughs> and so the fact that it came out anything pronounceable uh, instead of something like a few <laughs> consonants in order. <laughs> well, my, uh, my parents uh, are both uh, not practicing um, any uh, religion um, in any significant way. That hadn't been said. Um, my mother is uh, someone who does uh, believe in God and, uh, and actually, uh, alhamdulillah, she has uh, in recent months uh, even shown an interest toward Islam. Um, my father, on the other hand, is, uh, is a uh, person who would probably describe himself as, uh, as a non-believer. Um, and uh, my uh, upbringing was, uh, in terms of sheer number of years of my of my life before independence, was was actually uh, probably a little bit more with my dad uh, than my mom because they uh, split when I was three years old, uh, and uh, subsequent to that, uh, actually uh, the complexity of my family would would increase because uh, both of my parents eventually had uh, children with with uh, uh, second spouses, uh, or in the case of my father, actually more than his uh, second wife as. No, no additional children until he, he married a fourth time. Yeah. Uh, so I have an interesting, um, and uh, if, if not for you know, finding myself in the, in the uh, conclusion of, of Islam, uh, it would not be an atypical story for so many you know, people of my generation and uh, from my kind of background, I think. Yeah, um, uh, my mother's influence on me, uh, I think, uh, does deserve to, to be recognized uh, for what I would eventually uh, develop into. Um, that hadn't been said. It wasn't, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't really programmed toward any specific religious affiliation. But in some ways, when I compare this against uh, uh, comparisons I have from, from many you know, childhood friends and the like who, who did grow up in explicitly Christian or Jewish backgrounds, say, um, I find that, uh, that actually it might have been preferable a little bit in my case because as we know as Muslims, um, some of the, you know, the uh, theological um, stances that are found in, in some of the other Western monotheisms, uh, Christianity and Judaism, uh, I guess is the short list, uh, are, are really uh, not, uh, not the easiest thing to, to you know, extricate somebody out of if they really believe in things such as the Trinity and, um, and uh, you know, the article of, of the Son of God uh, for, for Jesus. Uh, so, you know, I, I think I, I would, especially in sort of formative years, I, I would be very glad when I saw friends who, uh, uh, who did grow up in more strictly religious households and I saw uh, a little bit maybe more closed-minded um, way of, uh, of taking in new experiences and information and ideas that I didn't feel restricted by. And yet, as you, you know, uh, suggested, uh, indeed there was maybe a little bit of uh, inclination toward a spiritual pathway. Uh, and you know whether this owes to my mom, it would be only in presence, not in, in really programming the in any particular direction. If anything, the the closest thing I would find to parallels going on inside of my own thought would not have really been found in in uh, in a long, continuous pattern of contact with with uh, friends of mine who would have been growing up in religious ha religious households. I mentioned that earlier, but. But I would say that uh, these were in a little bit of the younger years and then the, the true formative period of, um, uh, you know, being in sort of the later high school years and early college years uh, where, where I was really actually asking questions uh, at all. Um, this, this would probably see me um, affiliated more with those who would have prob probably described themselves as searching, maybe even using terms like agnostic that I, I today don't find very favorable, but, uh, but probably at one time or other out of maybe a little bit of ignorance would have even described myself as such. 
Um, but now I don't see a lot of inconsistency with where things would go because it was by keeping the most open agenda possible and not and knowing somehow that the idea of God was such an immense concept as not to be taken lightly and not to allow that to settle on something that could be described <laughs> as something that could be owned by anybody else. Th this was an instinctive uh, you know, guideline that I think I, I followed uh, on a subconscious level and be, would become increasingly conscious later. So, so yes, I mean, to answer your question, I think um, as far as an, any kind of uh, observing patterns of my friends and, and wanting to take the good and leave things that I found undesirable, I didn't, I would have seen more my sensibilities really of, of who I found likable, you know, imitatable qualities would have probably fallen more to those who didn't, didn't necessarily have a religious background as the years went by. That might, maybe this is something you've also encountered. In my case, I would describe the um, the domain as as mystical, but probably having been fed um, by by the fact that I was uh, in, in a school for the arts and uh, and was um, uh, very active, uh, not not just kind of getting by playing playing the oboe, which was my instrument, but really very active also in, in interesting music composition, visual art. I went to an interdisciplinary school, so there were dancers, there were there were artists, there were theater people design, production, music, you, you name it. Um, and so the, the, the interest in, in modes of artistic expression uh, was a really natural handmaiden to uh, you know, discovery of uh, the kind of cream of, of any artistic achievements that I w would ever come across as spiritual achievements. Um, well, again, not always pro identifiable or programmed as such by the very achievers of some of those uh, artistic visions, but un unmistakable to someone like myself that began to increasingly uh, find uh, a home for, for some of my, you know, um, some of my sensibilities as, as, uh, as I would, you know, in increase an in interest in, in, uh, in my own composition and in writing. Uh, I think now to this day, the thread remains consistent, the thing that would probably allow for, uh, for this, uh, you know, gradual transformation um, into interest in Islam really can, can be, uh, I, I can honestly claim that, that the, the fact of being a writer through all these years was probably what enabled it more than any other single factor. Personally being a writer and, and to understanding the significance of being able to formulate uh, logical ideas um, uh, in, in spiritual uh, matters that are normally considered to be a, a domain of opinion. So I was impressed that, uh, at, again, as time goes on, not, not even yet at Islam, I was just became impressed that one could take arguments that would normally be thought of as unprovable or the domain of pure opinion or emotions, spiritual ideas, and find that I never discovered this to be the case, but I felt with enough persistence and really reflecting on what I saw to be the truth, one could use writing to describe uh, these states that, uh, that are quite esoteric, uh, um, and, and mystical, as you mentioned. This is a relatively recent development for me, and, and, and going back to college years and then in the time, you know, five, six years after that, you know, so that we, we get a little closer to the current, it, it was really, um, you know, keeping an overview of, uh, of different philosophical traditions in the West, a little bit of interest in Eastern religions. Um, later that would become an, an interest more of being responsible to comparative religious studies, uh, more than, you know, interest per se in, in following anything. Um, and then uh, Islam was nowhere to be seen in that, in that early landscape. Uh, it would turn out that the first religion that I would uh, strictly observe was, was Catholicism. I became a Catholic myself, a, a confirmed Catholic. Uh, uh, at age uh, 30, I guess it was, 29 or 30? Uh, yeah, 30, I think. So scripture, I, I just uh, to interject one, one point, because we talk about writing, but something like that can seem very, very vague. I think before I knew of scriptures of any sort, the idea of scripture already registered in me. Um, the type of writing that I had done and still do, now very conscious of the fact of scriptures, and of course the greatest and uh, seal of all scriptures, the Quran, uh, has, has you know, informed my readiness for what scripture can mean. And this occurs, of course, East and West in the world's traditions, is things something like the Bhagavad Gita in the East is not any different from the concept of scripture than what we have in the Torah or uh, in the, Avan uh, the Angeal. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, something that uh, I, I found there was no, it was the most scientific conclusion one could draw if there's such a c 
connection to, to make as a writer is the most scientific conclusion one could draw would be that the natural evolution of all writing would be to scripture, even though ironically, in reality, our scriptures are kind of the mother of all the writing. It's the other way that we normally view them, that they, they inform all of the ideas of the world. I think this is where, you know, you, you've probably heard as an interviewer and, and you know, aside from uh, interviews, one can turn to literature of both those, you know, born into any faith and those who came to it, it doesn't matter. That's the consistent pattern, as we know, our, our Lord even says in, 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 uh, in Quran that, you know, if you think you won't be tested, think again. You know, so this, this uh, notion of being uh, tested even before having a religious discipline uh, was, was becoming pretty clear. Not yet maybe the notion of purification, which is, which is so um, essential to a basic understanding of any religion, the idea of purification by difficult trials of life, but certainly the fact that I, I no longer could possibly have any sympathies with the, uh, the picture of a worldly set of fascinations, a, a worldly set of preoccupations where things would begin and end in the world. Uh, and finding any kind of contentment from things which would in any way kind of glorify the world because I began to see God as the great unsung hero inside people, no matter who they are. Uh, the unsung hero meaning that the sad part to see in people's suffering is that they can't, they can't express him. And usually it's just, what I found is just out of a basic lack of education. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not these hard, hard and fast opinions we imagine. It's just a basic lack of education that there's even such thing as a Quran. Um, so, uh, I, I, I think, you know, in my case, uh, difficult experiences um, of a, you know, a, a personal nature that would be, I could mention them, but honestly, they're, they're very typical things. The, the experimentations of youth, uh, you know, uh, failed relationships, you name it. Um, these, these kinds of things, fa family issues, uh, and then many just cr crises of, of, you know, feeling completely at odds with, uh, the culture at large. I was able to trace back a personal culpability in everything that was happening to me. Mm -hmm. I began to understand this idea that one is accountable. It, it emerged as a clear picture, not only because maybe the nature of the sins, I, I always got the idea of sins. To me, uh, I don't remember which, uh, I, I think it was <laughs> a comedian like George Carlin said, if you're here, you're guilty. This idea that people in and of their nature are oftentimes masks in which elaborate sets of pretenses and, and things which we, we do to one another to impress one another, impress ourselves, think we're impressing ourselves and, and God forbid even impressing God, uh, are, are not an accurate picture of the truth. And that truth is that uh, there, there is a dark heart in man and that there, uh, he, is, uh, the he can be uh, found at the real set of causes for everything that happens to him which causes displeasure and, uh, you know, and, and uh, not the normal reactions of, of grieving for loved ones, this kind of grief, but the grief he goes through of, of his own device, sure. uh, his own devising. Uh, so th so um, uh, the, I think the notion of accountability and the power of God as something that would be a, a, a basic logical assumption to draw of anything that I could ever take seriously anymore after beginning to dawn on me that, you know, I really, hey, I really believe in God. My writings began to just mention God all the time. I said, man, this is believing in God. This is really, uh, you're arriving at it through natural religion of your own writing. And now you can see, you know, why this would feed into Quran later so beautifully because of the miracle of the Quran as, as a body of writing. Anyway, that, that idea, though, of, um, of respecting the power of God to punish and the, res and the power of God to call us to account for rules that are there, fixed, whether we're, we know about them or not, that he knows, mm -hmm. that he knows the actual design of things, that there's no flaw. <laughs> um, this, I, I began to see, to explain lots of things that otherwise, going around listening to people talk and listening to your whims, you would find nothing but dis dissatisfaction, nothing but bad guidance, nothing, nothing but just you constantly finding this is not gonna go anywhere that's ever gonna produce any kind of contentment. What appealed to me about Catholicism uh, and I should point out to right away because it will uh, become a recurring theme as we go from Catholicism to Islam later, I might as well introduce it, that uh, my introduction to Catholicism maybe helped my uh, viewpoint first in that religion as somebody without a religious background and later in Islam because it was the same person. My catalyst for coming to it was not a previously practicing Catholic. It was a person who converted to Catholicism from his background in having no uh, previous religious practice. So 
in both cases, this is a, you know something that when we get to Islam, I think you're going to um, probably recount interviews and realize that this is this is counts as the most unusual way to come is that a a person who is essentially on the same footing as yourself with regard to previous experience in the faith brings you to the faith. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but that's what happened with uh, Catholicism. Um, the the case with with my friend who uh, who did uh, provide the kind of introduction uh, to um, to Christianity as a whole and to Catholicism, um, it paired very nicely with um, my experience in art. I actually had been working with this individual uh, in the antiques and art trade, uh, and so the the obvious if you're uh, an an antiques dealer of uh, uh, dealing at, at somewhat of a high level with, in terms of cost, which we were. Um, the, the thing which you know, becomes uh, practically an inevitability is that you're going to encounter religious art of significance. And in this case, he was actually kind of an expert in icons, Russian icons to be specific, because he's Russian himself. Uh, he had a lot of knowledge about it. It turned out he had a lot of knowledge about the themes informing the, you know, the, visual, um, uh, the visuals of uh, Russian and Greek icons uh, as well. And this you know, provided an early... Um, point of, uh, of discussion for us. Uh, th however, the, th the thing that I think made Catholicism really specifically a pathway to choose for practice came down to feeling as though it embraced knowledge and embraced education uh, as a natural outgrowth, by the way, of what we see to this day of, of uh, Jewish traditions, where education is, is so highly prized and, and never became something um, antiquated in their values. It became, it, to this day, is, you know, practicing uh, Jews, uh, you know, perhaps exemplify uh, a notion of, you know, being very educated, not only in Torah, but in uh, whatever their, their particular worldly discipline is as well, oftentimes in, in sciences and, and in many other uh, disciplines, art, you name it. And so I think that the richness of Catholicism uh, as being kind of the, the collection um, point for uh, some of the most noble achievements in the, of, of the intellect in human history, uh, as, and at least in the way that I saw it and that my, my friends saw it as well, who were on the same pathway, uh, this, this was of great appeal to me. I saw it as not compromise. Usually the notion of religion among those without religion is that it's somehow an intellectual compromise or a stultifying uh, if, um, uh, influence. Quite to the contrary, I saw it as being the crown jewel of intellectual achievements as I looked deeper and deeper into it and from my friend's uh, studies in, uh, um, in some of the uh, kind of evolutionary tendencies in, 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 the, stu in the history of uh, religion uh, previous to Catholicism to see it as a natural outgrowth, to see Christ as a symbol, to understand these things as, as, uh, as Carl Jung would put it, archetypes uh, of, of human psychology. This seemed to me an, unli an unlimited bounty to explore and to grow in, um, which ironically would later on lead me away from <laughs> finding an appeal in it, but I can explain further. I would say that the, the religiosity um, that I would end up developing uh, in, in the Christian uh, tradition was probably um, fostered not so much from an outside of one looking in at, a, at beauty of traditions or, or of practice or even something that we would certainly recognize as Muslims of you know, noble moral traits of those who practice it. Sure, these things uh, were all very important, and, and as you already noted that I commented on before, the, the intellectual achievements and, and knowledge traditions. I think rather it was just seeing, again, specifically that it did speak to the evolutionary tendency in human consciousness to arrive at an idea, in this case, resurrection. So it was really specific to kind of informing the, the, um, the conviction that would become religious by being simply so con having su such a serious conviction about its truthfulness that, that religious practice, and in this case, the ones that Catholicism would prescribe, uh, was just a, a way of, again, kind of respecting the, uh, the content of, of the faith, that of, of trying to be humble enough to not separate the, the exoteric aspects of it from the esoteric, which sure would be more of my, my interest in it, as it were. There was probably nothing terribly dramatic to see from the outside except Prayer was a feature that, uh, that you know, maybe took some getting used to, um, and we certainly, <laughs> I can certainly tell you, did more of it uh, than you find the vast majority of Catholics in terms of daily rosary 
and many, many, um, uh, I, I want to call them supplications now, though I know that's not the term used of many of the saintly writings uh, about, uh, you know, Christ or, or uh, Mary, um, supplications directly to the, to the Father. Um, regardless, you know, the practice of prayer was, uh, was a little bit slow to develop, and, and I always felt uh, as though there was, it was difficult to pinpoint where this would all be going. You see, in Christianity, you, you are surrounded constantly by the kind of glories of religion, uh, the glo the, the, the depicting God's glory in very visual, worldly terms, even though it's alluding to glories, of course, that con continue beyond this world. It's very comfortable with depicting these visually, something we don't do in, in Islam as far as images are concerned. So they do, right? Uh, and this de these uh, depictions of, of the, the glories of uh, God d done in human interpretations of art and, and, and the like um, would you know, give the thinking person, I think, um, a, uh, uh, would give them something to have to consider where, where do I find my, my voice in this exactly? Where, I mean, the, the, when you are looking for the truth on a, on a, I think, passionate level and you are realizing that <laughs> the, the goal, if you want to call it a, a goal, even though it's the, na you know, the natural consequence of everything, is resurrection itself as though that were some kind of specialized event, because that's what it is inside Christianity, of mm -hmm. course. You, you feel as though it, there's a big divide between your daily practice and really being able to, to feel certain in your heart that this is connecting to that goal, because the goal there tends to be very abstract. Even if you really sit down, people talk about the abstract nature of defining what is the Trinity. I felt that uh, the, uh, maybe that abstract um, um, precept Inform some of the abstract um, uh, concept of resurrection as, again, this kind of goal. Very difficult to define and very difficult to figure out how you're going to get there. I would not, I would, I've not. i always been a very loyal person uh, with people in my life and in this case religion. I, would, I, you know, I, I certainly believed it was never a question of belief in God um, nor of understanding at least, which I still understand, the notion of a messiah. So these things on a conceptual level, they remained, and I remained steadfast, and uh, there wasn't anything, again, dramatic to suggest, oh, this is all gonna fall apart. I, I could, you know, hindsight 2020, I could see that, sure, there were cracks appearing in the wall, but as it would happen long before there would be anything of collapse, there was an event that would end up becoming kind of very, almost surreptitiously would just kind of, kind of come up, and next thing you know, you're like really uh, finding no problem just moving right into Islam, and uh, I'll explain. My, my same friend that brought us, uh, and I, when I say us, I do mean that there was one other Rebert brother who, uh, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah, still lives. Yes, yep, okay. three, and, and to this day, um, alhamdulillah, we, we remain close friends and still, um, uh, you know, neck and neck in this pathway. Um, so my, my friend uh, who had uh, some experience on, on the two of us, and uh, I mentioned before, is a, a Russian fellow, he, uh, he got a translation of Quran in Russian and uh, began to read, and hit for him, it was a matter of due diligence. This is somebody who was, you know, his attitude was simply, I'm interested in the truth. I don't care where it comes from. I'm not into any kind of uh, political orientation. I'm not interested in a cultural, uh, you know, point of reference to limit my, my decisions of where to look. I want the truth. I want to understand this major world religion. I want to understand the, the scripture which informs it. And so he turned in that direction. And before long, he started uh, telling us things that you saw a light in his eye, like, whoa, you know, this, this puts everything, first of all, that we're already doing in question. Let's make that very clear in many passages. But it also uh, is, I in and of itself, it's something that really is transparent as, as a religion is concerned in terms of practice, because it is really nothing more than, as it one passage in the Quran says, uh, man was commanded to be orthodox. It's really just orthodoxy in its very definition was what he began to, to demonstrate to us. You know, really, what do you see here? You see everything which if a person were to reflect, they would arrive at these conclusions. A person were really to reflect honestly, step by step, logically, they would come to these conclusions. If they didn't know a Quran existed, the most logical way to define God would be that he would never leave man without guidance to the truth. He would never, in fact, as we know from our specific pathway within Islam, he would never leave man without a living representative to guide to the spirit of that truth at all times. One who is infallible, in fact. 
So these are natural conclusions one would draw if one had never heard of Quran or Islam. This would be how you would define someone who comes to sound conclusions. And then to think of what constitutes a true believer. It would be someone who prays a lot. Someone who interrupts their day and their business to pray. This, these, I now believe, would be the kinds of things that one would naturally draw as conclusions if, again, given the right set of circumstances and, and being provoked. And, and I feel as though, uh, alhamdulillah, we, we had this unique uh, parallel uh, development of actually reading the, the Quran as, as the prescriptions themselves of encountering the reality of the Quran for what it is and realizing that inside yourself it's an awakening. It's an awakening to this being the basic natural state of man. So everything about it spoke to the natural uh, evolution that I mentioned before with Christianity coming from other previous uh, world religions, a natural evolutionary uh, gate opening, in this case not for, uh, not for any one particular revelation because in Christianity you could say it's resurrection uh, as an archetype in, in the human soul, what that means, but rather in Islam that it's awakening the basic characteristic of understanding that there's consequences which are, are fixed in terms of the fact that everybody has to answer for what they've done. It reminds this, brings it to the level of reward and punishment, of course, and does not let you, after that point, ignore who's speaking because it's really a kind of first-person speaker. I bring this up, this kind of thing up a lot to fellow reverts and we kind of like all immediately say, oh yeah, that's right. It, it is the only scripture, major world scripture, that in a sustained fashion consistently has that same speaking voice. This is one of the miracles of Quran, whether you're encountering it with no previous knowledge or whether you reflect on it after your whole life. That is that, my goodness, it's the same style throughout, though revealed over, over you know, many years. It's the same speaker, obviously, throughout. But this is no human speaker. And there are many ways, of course, you know, that later on we would, we would learn to kind of define what that means to, to each of us and, and also to be able to share it. But to be sure, the Quran, I think, in just the way it's supposed to be, the encounter with the scripture itself, without having met any Muslim yet, without having gone to, to uh, any masjid, mm. this was the encounter. The, for, for quite a while this went on, and you have to remember, we were very comfortable with having a, a, a little bit of a kind of like just a, a house separated from what other people were doing when it came to Christianity. Sure, we'd go for Sunday Mass and take sac the, the, the sacrament, um, but uh, the sacrament of Holy Communion. But uh, as far as, you know, where our aspirations lay, it was always that we had a, and have a library of thousands of books, thousands of books. Um, so this was a place that, if anything, we would <laughs> always uh, muse that going out into the public domain was usually some, something of a disappointment because we didn't find the same level of, you know, immersive scholarship. So. There was no problem for a really extended period of time, I'd say a year or greater, where we were almost exclusively just in our own domain. And it wasn't out of, uh, you know, holding some kind of, uh, you know, uh, resistance against meeting others or anything, but just because it was really working. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I should say, you mentioned that we were like-minded individuals. True, in the sense that we, we understood that even to get along as three uh, brothers in a house, uh, where you could be at loggerheads, this had to be a, a point of consensus. I mean, after all, Islam informs all of our life decisions, and so this seemed like the most, em not only eminently logical place for us in our unique set of circumstances, but that we began to extrapolate from this that there would be no way to ever have any true amity between individuals in the immediate house of you and your family, let's say, or in the larger society. Impossible without Islam in any lasting sense. Uh, of governance and uh, of, of interpersonal relationships. So step by step, it just all started to come together. And then from those very steps where it was theoretical domain, marriage, uh, conducting myself as far as observing food laws, you name it, then it became clear that the extension into a community would become the next logical step. And really probably through the framework, again, you know, sort of unique uh, to, to our uh, pathway as, uh, you know, the Shia Vali, or that we aspire for, uh, that, uh, that it is following scholars um, uh, who, you know, make rulings, are able to give fatwas about the common questions that we encounter, whether west or east. And so, the, you know, this necessity to have a little bit better sense of like, wow, you know, we, we really uh, don't want to invalidate our prayers, for example, by something of najasat being in the environment. 
like discovering that even such a thing existed, it suddenly became clear like, oh, there's really a lot of things to know here. And, and obviously not just about Dick, but I give an example because that's uh, I think a common uh, entry point of uh, really calling on the need for a scholar. <laughs> what we actually encountered first, I should, I should uh, go back for a moment really, is actually Sunni, Sunni uh, um, brothers. Um, in particular, one who was uh, in our antiques trade, which uh, at that time was still left over. I'm not actually in it anymore. Uh, he was a, a, a rug, uh, you know, carpet dealer, and uh, he took a great shining to us and, and kind of took us under his wing, even though it was more under wing for like, hey, if you want to come attend the masjid and, you know, introduce you to people, it wasn't, uh, you know, to, to so much uh, as a tutelage or anything. But anyway, so we, we really, uh, while, while to us we were just doing our due diligence of, of research and finding out sources and scholars, it turned out that our first extension <laughs> into any kind of uh, community was actually, of all the, the things now seemingly diametrically opposed to where I am now, uh, was to, uh, to encounter a, a Wahhabi mosque. And we didn't even know it until after the fact. So we, at least, yeah, actually, no, all three of, uh, of us uh, took our, our, our Shahada in that uh, Wahhabi environment uh, in, in, in the greater Toronto area. And uh, it wasn't until after the fact that our, our brother, who, who really was not a, a sympathizer to, to Wahhabis, and we'd actually had this conversation because we, you know, we immediately started you know, doing research about uh, you know, different, uh, different sects within you know, uh, what, what they would consider themselves, at least uh, within Sunnism. Uh, we, we, you know, we're, we were just totally uh, put off by the notion that we had you know, done this and kind of, we had not really been properly informed. So I think it left a bitter taste in the mouth that later we would learn kind of extended into really, uh, you know, fundamental uh, it kind of things which cannot, cannot exist there as, as being in a corrupted state and hope for any serious cohesion in your religion that we saw right from that first. In uh, in our encounter um, with with uh, you know, with Quran. yes with with uh, with the practitioners of uh, uh, Abu Sunnah as you mentioned uh, before, so th this uh, this I think gave us a powerful impetus to look into to now at this point consciously look into uh, the, the scholars of, of the Shia and and, uh, and then actually kind of after the scholars really the the directly to the to the holy imams there was there was in general we we felt. Uh, as though the the ability to embrace ideas for their universal uh, appeal to again reason and logic and not having to rely on uh, simply adopting something and following it without the ability to survive questioning this uh, you know in our way of thinking very very weak argument toward religion seemed to be as far as the few Sunni brothers that we would speak with uh, would be able to take it. For example, you would mention uh, even the idea of Shia, even when they were not Wahhabi and didn't necessarily house enmity toward uh, Abu Bayt, there would still be mm -hmm. that, you know, just knee-jerk reaction. This was always, I, I, I've read this, by the, by the way, before with, with other <laughs> revert Muslims, where telling them, don't do this, or we have a real problem with this, is the surest invitation to keep looking, because, I mean, my goodness, what do you think we, we did? We had to question, we had to resist uh, what, what one would just say, oh, you're supposed to do this because. So it was, it was pretty apparent that there was, there was intellectual rigidity there. And furthermore, that when, when one would look into it, as I, as I alluded to earlier, you would see that there's a, a serious flaw, uh, a very serious flaw in the theological uh, you know, beginnings uh, to, to the entire um, perspective on, on having companions, for example, to the prophet uh, be a, a reliable source for uh, even even just traditions themselves, let alone being seen as role models and the like. Uh, it's very and, and it was very native to our thinking about again Quran as a miracle because if Quran is incorruptible and a miracle, uh, and itself is is it's the, it's a literally a, a living seed, the body of which is is really uh, the uh, the twelve holy imams, you might say. And this would mean that uh, we would we would be saying about God that He would leave in the hands of those who are not infallible, the work of his absolute seal on the fate of humanity. This is just, to, to me, it's so instinctive. I, I, I would wonder what anyone could even say, and I haven't yet 
had the opportunity, but I'd love to have the opportunity to simply just point blank ask that question of, uh, you know, someone who, who calls themselves a follower of the Sunnah of the Prophet, which I believe that certainly we as uh, Shia uh, embrace equally. I mean, let's talk about it in the terms of like, seriously, who are your sources? The, the first encounters with uh, the Shia community, um, again, greater Toronto area, th and that's where uh, I should mention this has been localized uh, and, and remained um, despite coming, uh, all three of us having come, come by way of the United States. Uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was very positive from the first. Uh, we, we found in, uh, in Molana Rizvi, um, the alum there, uh, a, uh, a very warm uh, figure and yet at the same time someone of, uh, um, who was not, not trying to be overly, um, you know, there, there, there wasn't any kind of need to pretend in any way or to be overly anxious to to you know, embrace it. It was just a, uh, just a very serious, like, e very even-handed treatment, and I think that this was this made us actually feel better because we didn't want uh, any kind of feeling of being solicitous toward us or anything. Um, I, I think that 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 encountering the comfort zone of this is who we are. We already know who our sources are. While some <laughs> um, reverts might find this a little off-putting that they, it can be a cool exterior, I actually understand it perfectly well because when you know that your sources are infallible in, their, you know, in, the, in the sense of the imams and then by the scholars that come from it of the highest level of discernment and, and other faculties, you really, I mean, you don't have to worry about uh, people's opinions and their ever-changing whims and who is this person, that person, because it is, after all, working quite well to, uh, to give you a path of assuredness in following, uh, in following the Holy Prophets, uh, you know, um, uh, direction for his for his Ubah. So, I, I perfectly understand this, and I think that I in extension to to this uh, kind of first set of encounters, it would all fall into place nicely. That uh, uh, primarily from a from a vantage point of wanting to be able to attend Jamu'at prayer and and the like, uh, some of the the kind of usual fringe activity you'd expect, where you'd be approached afterwards and asked very gingerly, very politely, always, you know, how did you come to this? Uh, this, th I think that this was um, from the first an opportunity really to educate, which I think they were surprised by that we saw, that we, sorry, had a desire to educate about points rather than just tell a story. Um, and I don't know how many other reverts would share this, this uh, kind of angle on the usual uh, idea of simply telling one's uh, tale. Yeah. But for us it certainly was the case. I would say we're going on, oh, perhaps a mere six, seven months, something like this, since, since the first encounter, I guess. Time seems to have flown by, but something like this, uh, and and it's uh, it just c it continues to get better. Uh, I, I feel as though you know the Bali com com committee there. I, I think they call themselves uh, uh, has you know done a, a very capable job of uh, reaching out to us and and uh, certainly you know giving any kind of uh, uh, you know accommodating us for any questions that we might have of a practical nature. And frankly, and this would be a good note to sort of close on, I think that this this question of the practical necessities of making a living, things which intersect with fiqh a lot, questions of marriage, uh, legality, non-legality. Uh, th this, uh, this will remain and probably will remain for a long time for the average revert, especially male, I think, uh, remain one of the greatest challenges. Uh, you know, one, especially in the North American community, one looks around and sees women, of course, shuttled in through a different entrance and then immediately departing. There's, there's not a feeling that you're going to have much of a chance, and so you kind of have to go outside your comfort zone and do something that seems very odd to go up to a turbaned man and say, um, do you think you could possibly uh, have a look for me around the community for a suitable companion? <laughs> so this is, a, you know, this is going outside of what one would have been used to. In, in North America. And yet, at the same time, uh, I feel as though it's, it is actually through a, a, I see no contradiction in this being a, a perfectly uh, a reasonable religious um, activity to look into the legality of things through, for example, studying multiple marriages. I don't know how much born Muslims would have this much desire to do so, not out of, in our case, trying to bend rules sure. or accommodate them to our way of life, but rather to actually say to ourselves, okay, wait a minute. In fact, does there need to be uh, some some apprehensions that we're having that actually might be cultural in some way. So it's an educational process and finding out that actually I don't, at this point, I don't find Islam restrictive, for example, in spousal selection. I, I would disagree with that standpoint. I think it, maybe it would be a little bit, a little bit more for, for our Sunni brothers, but I think that 
our, the knowledge that, that we have, um, we have mechanisms, mechanisms in place to avoid sinfulness, even the knowledge that that exists keeps one, again, realizing that your Lord did not leave you in some kind of lurch. This is very important and I feel as though, you know, ironically perhaps, uh, and with no discredit whatsoever to any community, I think it's just this way, you know, that you end up relying more on, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance even in the most practical matters. And I don't know what tradition is, maybe you could recall, but I think there's one, uh, perhaps going back to Imam Ali, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to misquote. Uh, we're, you know, basically paraphrasing, I wouldn't wish to, you know, tie my sandal without, uh, without turning to Allah for basically the, you know, support or the guidance. Uh, so I understand this. Like it, it does eventually become there are there are no going to there's not going to be someone surfacing saying make it easy for you, give me an easy answer. And so the comfort level with having uh, difficulty at integrating in the contemporary West with its political scene, the difficulty of integrating with our family backgrounds, the difficulty of integrating with, uh, w for example, just simply women by and large not maintaining hijab, whether e even many from you know Muslim majority countries or obviously in our you know native born in North America. These things end up not, uh, not seeming like uh, constant annoyances or frustrations, but over time have seemed to fall in place with, okay, these things uh, as a challenge uh, off also offer p potentially greater merit. So this yeah. next chapter I can be wide-eyed and full of hope that uh, that's something that hasn't taken place yet, that for most born Muslims is already a matter of course, that they're married with kids that at my tender age of 35 is still a future. So it's like having a, another, uh, kind of teenage uh, uh, phase where you're looking at the future like it's still way off. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs>